the U.S. is dishing out another blow to China, this time for its ambitions on U.S. soil. Lawmakers have introduced a new House bill that, if passed, would ban China and other adversaries from purchasing American farmland. The measure echoes another bill revealed just last week in the Senate with a similar goal. But how far can these measures go? And will they serve their intended effects? Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Beijing's efforts to buy up U.S. land are taking another hit. On Monday, a House lawmaker presented a bill that would ban China and other adversaries from purchasing American farmland. Representative Mary Miller is backing it. Here's more. It's called the Saving American Farms from Adversaries Act. It would prohibit foreigners from buying public or private land in the U.S. for five years. This is Miller's first bill in the new Congress. The Congresswoman says America is on a dangerous path of losing self-sufficiency in farming and that Congress must respond to the economic and national security threats posed by China. Another related bill hit the Senate floor last week. Sponsored by Senators Mike Rounds and John Tester, the bipartisan bill would block China, Russia, Iran and North Korea from buying or leasing U.S. farmland and agricultural businesses. Speaking on the evening edit with Fox News, Senator Rounds explained that food security is national security and added that the Chinese Communist Party has increased their holdings of farmland outside of China by a thousand percent in the last few years. They own 1,300 egg processing facilities outside of China at a value of $35 billion. But there's another concern. Even bigger than food security is the issue of national security. As some farmland China has bought or is trying to buy are near critical U.S. military bases. In response, 22 U.S. states are either taking or considering measures to restrain foreigners from buying farmland. That's nearly triple the states taking similar initiatives two years ago. The new Congress set up a bipartisan select committee on China last month. High on its to-do list is reviewing China's ambitions on U.S. soil. The alleged Chinese spy balloon has been shot down, but the questions surrounding it are still hovering over the United States. The major query right now, is China planning to send more balloons over the U.S.? The White House says it's likely. This is not the first time and will not likely be the last time that the Chinese have sent surveillance balloons over the continental U.S. As for other questions, will U.S.-China relations be weakened by the balloon incident? Biden said Monday that the takedown of the balloon didn't damage Washington's relationship with Beijing. And here's White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre's comment. And it's up to China to show it is serious about its words of being a responsible country. And so it's up to China to, to figure out what kind of relationship that they want. This after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken postponed his China trip indefinitely last week. China described the balloon as not American on Tuesday. That was the reply to a spokeswoman who asked whether China had requested the balloon debris be returned. She added that Beijing will continue to defend its legitimate rights and interests. Earlier, Beijing filed a formal complaint with the U.S. It called the decision to shoot down the balloon an attack on a Chinese civilian unmanned airship by military force. A second balloon detected above South America appears to still be lingering in the region. Beijing also claims it's of a civilian nature. And looking to China's neighbor, flying objects have also been reported to have flown over Japan in the past. The nation is looking at potential links between the spy balloon in the U.S. and flying objects in Japan. Apple reportedly removing a Twitter-like social media app from its Chinese app store. The decision because of content deemed illegal by the Chinese communist regime. The software is called Damus. Its developer shared a screenshot of a notification from Apple on Friday. It states that the app failed a security assessment of information services with attribute of public opinions or capable of social mobilization, adding that it would be removed from the China App Store because it includes content that is illegal in China per demand from the Cyberspace Administration of China. The removal comes just two days after Apple approved Damas' listing in the App Store. 
Damis is built on top of Noster, a decentralized social media protocol. It's designed to give users full control over their data. Former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey donated 14 Bitcoin to its development last year. That's around $320,000. The removal from China's App Store is likely due to the decentralized structure of the Noster protocol. That's because it could allow users to circumvent Beijing's internet censorship. The app entered the top 10 in the social networking chart just hours after its release. A new protest in Wuhan last Friday, with locals rallying against a planned waste disposal site. Hundreds gathered outside a district government building, calling on authorities to pick another location for the facility. Under the official plan, the landfill would become one of the city's largest, spanning an area of more than six acres. But it will sit adjacent to a national wetland park, with multiple schools and residential areas just half a mile away. It's probably only 800 meters away from where we live. The elementary school and the construction is very close, just about 600 meters away. The residential density here is especially high, with seven or eight neighborhoods, four or five universities around, and many kindergartens. Fong added that officials refused to present any documents assessing the project's environmental impact. Residents fear such a large landfill would prove disastrous for the ecosystem and public health. After fruitless appeals to the Land and Resources Bureau and other relevant authorities, opponents decided to launch the protest. But authorities swooped in almost immediately. Footage online shows police dispersing the protesters through violent means. One man visibly lifted up and arrested by several police officers. The police arrested about 20 people and hadn't released them by nearly 10 p.m. the next night. Other protesters have gathered outside the police station, demanding release for the detained. Next, remember these young people? They joined a Beijing vigil last year, gathering to remember those who died in a building fire that sparked under China's lockdown. But after the memorial, one by one, attendees started to vanish. Now, human rights groups and universities are condemning Beijing for their disappearances. Here's the story. Beijing has been quietly rounding up people who protested against its COVID-19 rules. International Press Freedom Watchdog Reporters Without Borders, or RSF, revealed that over 100 demonstrators remain in detention in China. The CCP has a tradition of binding its time for revenge and then secretly arresting people, and it does not want others to know about the arrests. One of them is Li Sechi, a graduate from Goldsmiths University of London. In November, she attended a public vigil for Beijing for the victims of an apartment building fire in Xinjiang. Beijing's zero COVID-19 restrictions had prevented people in the lockdown building from escaping. Reports say Li is still detained in China and spent her 27th birthday in custody. The University of London called it a suppression of free speech and urged Beijing to immediately release all those detained in relation to the vigil. Another vigil participant, Tao Shirshin, also remains in custody. She recorded this video after her friends and fellow vigil joiners started disappearing one by one. Former journalist Chin Zeyi also got arrested. Her alma mater, the University of Chicago, called for her release. And she was let out on bail last month. It's difficult to estimate the scale of the arrests, as relatives of the detainees refused to speak out for fear of more serious retribution. New evidence is calling Beijing's latest virus death count into question. China's CDC added more than 3,000 to the country's COVID-19 death toll. That was during the week from January 27th to February 2nd. The figure brings the country's official total to over 82,000. But a survey by the Epoch Times shows that actual death in just one city may far exceed that number. The report cites 15 funeral homes in Shanghai that run at least 80 cremation furnaces, with 33 bodies cremated per furnace per day. There were at least 160,000 local deaths in the 60 days after China's zero COVID-19 policy was lifted. This without counting the unburned bodies piling up at funeral homes. The largest crematorium in Shanghai told NTD that it now takes more than a month before ashes are ready for pickup.
You have to wait a month to collect the ashes. It's not possible to do it faster. Previous remains must be dealt with first. Residents in Shanghai say the wait time used to be about an hour. Funeral homes work in three shifts, 24 hours a day. That's still too slow. In times of high demand, they may even burn two bodies together, and it still takes a couple of months to return the ashes. By then, customers will wonder if the ashes are even their loved ones. I went to the funeral home and saw the dead piled up in batches. Some say they burned two to three bodies at once. People were told to wait half a month before they can collect the ashes. The problem is, you don't even know whose ashes you'll be collecting. Is Facebook handing over American user data to Chinese companies? U.S. Senators Mark Warner and Marco Rubio have some questions for Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. They want to know if Facebook developers in China and Russia have access to certain user data. Here's the latest. The bipartisan pair say they have an internal meta document that reveals that. Their offices released their letter to Zuckerberg yesterday. They wrote that the document shows 90,000 developers in China had been given access to sensitive user information. That includes private messages, profile data, and photos. That's despite Facebook never being able to operate in China. The senators say over 42,000 developers in Russia had access to the information and thousands in Iran and North Korea. They say Facebook appears to have known since at least 2018. Facebook did not immediately respond to a request for comment. It's still unclear if the Facebook data in question is related to American users. Is China helping Russia in the Ukraine war? Experts say Beijing is sending military technology over to Russia. Gear like fighter jet parts, navigation equipment and jamming technology. All in violation of sanctions. Let's take a closer look. The Wall Street Journal looked at over 84,000 shipment records. Tens of thousands of those shipments contained products that could be used in the military. We talked to international politics expert Anders Kort. Russia depends on complicated navigational uh, computer chip parts for all of its weaponry, whether that is, uh, you know, smart bombs, uh, cruise missiles, uh, jet fighters, Um, And the U.S. and Europe have sanctioned those items to try to stop the production of uh, uh, Russia's bombs and and delivery systems. Uh, So when China steps in uh, with those products, China is enabling the Russian regime in a direct way. Some examples include China's state-owned aircraft firm Avic, which shipped $1.2 million worth of fighter jet parts to Russian defense firm Rostec. There's Chinese state-owned defense firm Poly Technologies, which gave military helicopter navigation equipment to Russian state-owned Rossoborn Export. There's Fujian Nan'an Baofeng Electronic Company, which sent communications jamming equipment to Rossoborn Export. We talked to someone from Ukraine, economics professor Roman Shermeta. He believes this is just business as usual for China. Businesses are driven by self-interest, right? So if um, since Russia is not getting technology and uh, equipment and things necessary for war anywhere else, the Russia is willing to pay a significant premium to get those technologies and th- that equipment. And so obviously... You know, uh, for somebody who is doing business, who is after the profit, it's a very lucrative option. Shermeta says that if these reports are confirmed, China may face consequences, and these consequences could greatly harm China's export-oriented economy. We spoke to foreign policy expert Harley Lipman, who says the U.S. needs to put pressure on China. The United States has a number of economic levers that it could use with China. I mean, China still needs the United States to purchase its goods and to operate in the world economy that it does. The United States is still the largest market in the world. It needs the United States, and it needs to uh, do business with Western Europe. That means that the United States and Western Europe has leverage. We could apply pressure to China. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was supposed to go to Beijing this weekend and discuss China's relationship with Russia. 
But because of the Chinese surveillance balloon caught floating in the U.S. airspace, the meeting has been postponed to an unknown time. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Do problems in China really impact Americans? And that's our job, is to awaken the consciousness of uh, people and institutions and explain to them what's at stake. We sat down with Rabbi Abraham Cooper, vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, to zoom in on that question and hear about his experiences with communist China's threat to the democratic U.S. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.